tonight's uh, discussion is going to be on exploits. It's sort of an introduction to exploits. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun, I think. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that we're going to have a really, really large amount of fun here. If you want to follow along, uh, if you noticed, we were showing the Wi-Fi credentials and stuff like that. If you'd like to follow along, you can go to retro64xyz.github.io. I'm having to use that as sort of a halfway house for my web page right now. Um, so it's on the GitHub pages. If you want to head over there, you can actually click on Introduction to Exploits. And you can follow along on the web page and see everything that I'm doing up here. Uh, and then plus, we'll have, it'll also give you access to uh, Actually, let me see how the code's going to look here. So, well, it's okay. Uh, it shows you some code highlighting and things like that. So, I guess we will go ahead and get started. So, our performance objectives tonight. At the conclusion of this course, you will be able to identify at least three types of attack vectors. You're going to identify a piece of software that can be used to execute a brute force attack, at least one. We're going to identify what the main concepts of two-factor authentication is. We're going to identify a Linux operating system that is used for penetration testing. We're going to identify a product used to manage two-factor authentication. And then we're going to identify a training ethos that will make users more likely to stay safe. So tonight, we're going to actually talk about some actual attacks. In addition to that, if you're going through the web page, you're going to see some warnings in there. Because I do link to some GitHub pages where there are things like Locky. And if you're not familiar with Locky, that is one of the malware that is used to crypto lock your, your system. So uh, due diligence. If you're going to be following along and you're going to be looking at this stuff, please do not go in there and start pulling stuff down from GitHub and locking up your system. Uh, I don't want to hear anybody exclaiming in the middle of this thing that, what do I do now? Uh, <laughs> so there are some warnings in there. Please heed them, OK? So. We're going to be talking about actual attacks, methods, and then also mitigation techniques. And we want to look into how we can protect our users from these kinds of attacks, or ourselves, you know. Uh, now, the vast majority of online attacks are opportunistic, and they're designed to take advantage of user ignorance, fear, or laziness. OK? If you're not doing your updates, if you're using admin, admin is your login credentials. If you're not taking care of your server, if you're not being a good neighbor with everybody else out on the internet, there's a good chance that you're going to end up becoming a victim. And if you're not, you're not going to be the only victim. Let's put it that way, OK? When somebody gets a hold of your server, they want it for a reason. All right? They want your computer for a reason. They want access to your email for a reason. There is a benefit to them when they get access to what you have. OK? So not only are you harmed, but you're just another nexus towards being able to harm others. We also want to make sure that you're aware of these attacks. Because if you're unaware, it makes you an easy target. If you don't know what to look for, it's real hard to defend against this stuff, right? You have to be able to think like these individuals. You have to understand what they're doing and why. What is the value in what they're doing against you? Okay. Uh, in addition to that, we want to boost your confidence here. Because that's important as well. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the age old, hey, this is the IRS, and you owe us $10,000, but if you send me 50 bucks right now, you know what? We'll let it slide. That's a very popular scam. They pick up the phone, they start randomly dialing, or they use their American Association of Retired People's phone number list, and they just start hitting people. And if they can get 10 people out of that list, guess what? They made a, you know, more than minimum wage. So we want to increase your confidence so you understand what they're doing. Make you safer by understanding these things. And then, of course, we also want to talk about best practices and methodology. So number six, when I talked about up here, identifying a training ethos that will make our users more likely to stay safe, I kind of want to share something with you here that I follow and a lot of the, the law enforcement officers that I know follow, a lot of people from the Guard. Uh, believe in this ethos. If you train like you fight, you will fight like you train. And this, uh, this applies to us as software developers, as computer programmers, as server administrators. If you are using real information, if you have that tactile feedback of whatever it is that you're doing, you will better understand what the people out there 
are doing, what they want from you, why they want it. All the things that I just covered, everything there is summed up in you have to understand what's really going on out in the world for you to be able to defend against it. Because if you don't know what they can do, then you're not going to be able to stop them. We're going to learn how the opposing force is scheming and educating themselves to gain access to your data. You're spending your Tuesday night here with me in the hopes of all of us coming out of this a little bit more enriched, and I really do appreciate that. I'm really glad that you all are here. But we have to understand that that opposing force is out there doing the same thing. Every day they're sitting on web forums, trading information. There are people out there selling botnets. There's people out there selling access to code, everything that they need to be able to accomplish their mission. And so we're sort of on the defensive here, right? We have to wait until somebody heads towards us for these kind of problems. So we want to focus on these real life scenarios. There's some seats up here if you need anything. And I see a couple back there. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is brute forcing. Okay? And brute force cracking is a method by which an individual attempts to enumerate the login credentials for a service or application through the exhaustive effort of trial and error. And now we're going to get a little pedantic in here, here in a moment, because we're also going to talk about um, what's called a dictionary attack. And so some people do differentiate these two items. Because a brute force attack, the idea is, is I start with username A, password A. Did it work? No? All right. Username A, password B, so on and so forth. Until either I get in or I exhaust all chances. And I'm sure everybody here has ever seen something that says, you know, if you encrypt this file and you use the proper encryption, it will take 2.7 million years to be able to break into this thing if you're enumerating all of the attempts, right? Well, A, we don't care about that. B, they don't care about that either. Because if the web page says in big, bold letters, hey, it starts with eight characters and you can't go more than 12, well, that just really narrowed down the size of our attack, right? I don't need to worry about six-digit long passwords if you can't even use a six-digit long password. Um, one more thing, and we should keep this in mind, is that a brute force attack can also potentially be identified by a denial of service issue. Legitimate users will suffer. The performance of your server will suffer when you have a whole bunch of folks making attempts in series to gain access to your server. Um, real life example, I was working on a server that was having some slowdown. The server itself was running Nginx, and in addition to Nginx, we had an Apache web application on it, and we were having lack of performance. Huh, that's weird. First thing I did was go look at the logs, and guess what I find? Hundreds of attempts to get into the system. Somebody just sitting there enumerating off of the username admin and just sending password after password. Okay, that's a problem. There's things that I need to do to mitigate that. And of course, we're going to get into that mitigation here shortly. But taking another step back, let's go back to that brute force attack versus dictionary attack. Now, the dictionary attack is a method by which an individual will use a list of suspected passwords against a service in order to reduce the number of attempts made. Now, legitimate passwords used in other products are often the fuel that feeds a dictionary attack. I'm not ashamed to say that I used Adobe products. And guess what? Adobe's system was owned probably two years ago, I would say. And I was a victim in that attack. Somebody was able to get into Adobe stuff, and they got access to usernames, they got access to passwords, they got access to a whole bunch of information, and I was in that. And so they had access to the password and the username that I used with that Adobe product, and I had the little message, and of course, not that I noticed the difference, but I'm sure my email received an influx in spam just because of that situation. Individuals are going out there and they're finding products that they can get into to get access to those usernames and passwords. And of course, this is going to go back to our mitigation, and we are going to discuss that here shortly. But when they get into these systems, there's a reason for that. Because 
people are reusing their passwords. They're reusing their logins. And if they can get into one system, then potentially they can start getting into a whole lot more simply because they can follow the rabbit hole. I get into Adobe, I find out what your username and your password is. I find out some of the stuff that you're interested in. That's a little bit of open source intelligence. I go to Google, I take your email, I put it into Google. I start seeing what kind of stuff you do, where you go. Yes? I was wondering, uh, a typical a good system when they store password, they wasn't they have the hash use at MK5. So in that case, it cannot be reverse engineered. So well, it should be safe though. The keyword is, oh, uh, should. Right. The key word is, is should, because there's a lot of companies who have not done that. And I can tell you, even this year, they have gotten into systems that are not doing that. They're not adding any kind of uh, hash to the password. Some of them are still printing it in plain text. Some of them are, and these are banks. Like when I, when I give you these examples, these are not like, oh, some guy is running a, a BBS and he's got a little bulletin board system where he hangs out and talks about Hot Wheels. I'm talking about there are major financial institutions located overseas that literally use your, what amounts to a driver's license number for the login credentials and then the password is all stored in plain text. So should, they should be doing these things, but they're not. And taking a step off of that, just expect them not to. When you are setting up your stuff, just expect for them to not follow best practices because it's so often that they don't that you should be prepared for when these people make mistakes. So let's talk about bulk passwords first and then we're gonna move forward from that. So there are individuals working around the clock and around the globe to find leaked passwords, usernames, emails, all of this stuff on a consistent basis. It's constant, okay? Now you can find these curated lists on GitHub, private websites, the dark webs, and through Torrent. So what I have here is a small collection that I present. This one right here is a sec list. This is a GitHub page that you can go to. And if you head on over here to passwords, they just have tons. 10 million password lists with the top 500. We got top uh, 1 million. We've got, uh, you know, best passwords. Uh, what's that? 500 worst passwords. There's all kinds of stuff in here. Tons of passwords that are all coming from web pages that somebody went through and curated. Now, I'm going to warn you right now, some of these passwords are not safe for work. Okay? There's some naughty words in here. But we're all adults, so um, if you find anything in there, you know, chuckle softly. But I just kind of want to give you an idea here as I start up here at the top and just sort of scroll through. It's a lot of scrolling, right? And some of these lists right here are more than 10 million. And these are legitimate passwords curated from tons and tons of people's web pages. Folks who are running bulletin board systems, folks who are using non-best practices would probably be the best way to put this, to take care of your public information, your data. You have stuff from Twitter, you have stuff from Adobe in there. When you have time, just sit down, take a little bit of time, start looking through this. Um, another thing that I like to have my students do um, is I will have them go in and pull down one of these large passwords lists and use grep and take and run grep over it and tell them, look for some words that you use for passwords in there. See if you can't find your own passwords in that list. And I will tell you right now, I've had people go, oh, whoa, I found my stuff in here. So it happens. In addition to that, I have another list right here, 10 million passwords available in a torrent. And that also includes usernames. So you can go in there and all you have to do is regex by space. So you can get the full set of usernames and then the full set of passwords with a regex by space, set them up to a variable, put them in an array, whatever it is that you want to do. But you have a tool right there to be able to enumerate. And that's a big list, right? 10 million. And this person who curated this made sure that there were no copies, there was no duplicates, nothing. Okay. 
So something to keep in mind. In, it, in addition, you're going to see some checksums here. Uh, if you were to pull down that torrent that's up here, uh, there are some checksums there so that you can verify that the torrent is real, true, and correct uh, if you feel inclined to do so. However, I do want to touch on the question that was asked, shouldn't they be hashing this stuff? Shouldn't they be taking care of this stuff? Case in point, proof. There's plenty of places to go out there and find people's passwords. It's all available out there in the wild. So discussing password cracking and brute forcing, let's talk about our first application of the evening. And what we're going to talk about here is WP scan. And WP scan is an application designed to work as a vulnerability scanner as well as provide some ability to conduct attacks against WordPress websites. Now, I'm touching on WP scan first because guess what? A whole lot of the internet runs on WordPress. A whole lot. And if you are a WordPress administrator and you're not on shared hosting, I am sure if you're like me, you have tail effed your logs and sat there and watched as people have attempted to enumerate into your site. So for those of you who are new or don't know me, I'm a huge fan of Docker. Love Docker. Docker is a great tool. So in all of my lessons, what I try to do is I try to make sure that there are either Docker machines available or Docker machines that I create so that people can follow along with this stuff. I have a Docker machine here for WP Scan that I located, and that comes from the WP Scan team. And all you have to do is run Docker pull WP Scan team forward slash WP Scan, and guess what? You're up and running. You have access to WP Scan. Uh, if you are interested in enumerating users for a WordPress blog, the command is right here Docker run WP Scan team forward slash WP Scan. Uh, you send it a URL, tell it to enumerate, and give it U for users. And it will actually sit there and try to find all of the users for the WordPress site for you. Again, entropy. If I start with nothing, it's a lot harder to get in. But if you start by building a foundation, if I know what users exist, will that just reduce me from having to search for user A, user B, user C, so on and so forth, to, oh, there's Aaron. Aaron's got a user on that server. I know what his username is. Great. I can start there. In addition to that, I've got a word list here for brute forcing a WordPress account. So if you're using Docker, um, we're not going to touch too much on Docker security, but you can provide a Docker machine, a folder. You can expose that folder would be the keyword if you decide to Google this stuff. You can expose a folder to Docker. If you do so, you can place your password lists inside that folder, and then you can tell Docker, hey, here's the password list. While well, you're enumerating through there, go ahead and use this right here to go look. And that would be your command right here. Uh, I'll go over it just a little bit. We'll touch on it because if, I hope everybody understands this is a mixed room of different skill levels, so we're just going to work at a baseline, OK? So we have Docker run dash V, and then I'm exposing the folders. I'm using that tilde right there with a forward slash word list because that's my home directory. And so I'm saying, hey, word list right here is my folder. I'm going to expose that folder to root word lists for the Docker machine itself. So once you understand how that works right there, it's very, very easy to sort of understand exactly what we're doing through this whole command. And then, of course, I'm spawning WP scan team forward slash WP scan. And then I give it a URL. And it's a little cut off because I'm using that reader mode. But if you're following along at home or you decide to go to the web page, fantastic because it'll all be there for you in an easy to copy and paste method. In addition to that, another very nice thing about WP Scan is they keep lists of vulnerable plugins. And so you can go in there and you can enumerate over the plugins. If you want to know all the plugins that are being used by that WP web page, fine. You can go in there and you can find that out. But you can also tell it, you know what? I don't care about any plugins except for ones with known vulnerabilities. It's that easy. It's extremely simple to enumerate over these objects 
and just say, I just need to know whether or not this thing has a hole in it or not, and can I exploit that hole? So continuing on with the theme of brute forcing and enumeration, we're also going to talk about InCrack. And InCrack is a gold standard tool for cracking network authentication. It can be used to attack SSH, RDP, and more. RDP being remote desktop for Windows boxes. This, is, this tool is extremely powerful and comes from the same peoples who brought you InMap. So if you're familiar with InMap, which you probably are if you've taken some of the courses that we talked about earlier during this uh, past couple of months. I did, I did discuss InMap. Well, guess what? InCrack is another tool. And there's tools like Jack the Ripper, Medusa. There's a whole bunch of different cracking tools that are out there. I like InCrack. I think it's a, a pretty neat tool. I've already got a Docker machine for it, of course. So uh, I found it to be useful for my needs. Obviously, there are alternatives, uh, and they're pretty easy to find. So docker run dash v hacker files, hacker files, we can expose a folder to it. Uh, and then we can set up docker in crack here. And then if you want to enumerate passwords with in crack, you can do so with the command. When you run this command right here, it'll actually drop you into an SSH terminal for that docker machine. And so then you can run that command almost as if you're native on the box. You're essentially inside of the box. You run in crack dash p for port 22. You can set up your, your user of root and then switch P for your password list, which you head on further up and you find lots and lots of passwords in those password lists. And then we give it an IP address. And it will sit there and it will enumerate through that. In addition to that, uh, it supports threading. So if you want to speed it up, you can increase the number of threads. However, if you're practicing this uh, locally, like with a virtual machine, if you're going to be practicing this stuff at home, Understand that your virtual machine uh, potentially could be kind of limited. So you can essentially DOS your box, denial of service the box, when you're sitting there enumerating over passwords with multiple threads trying to get in. So just keep that in mind. Uh, performance wise, it's not going to be as good on your local machine as it may be when you're running something like this off of a server located externally hooked up to a great big old gigabit pipe. So now that we talked about all these cool toys, let's talk about mitigation, because that's important. How do we defend against this stuff? It's easy, right? A handful of co commands. I go in, I download a couple of things, I dump them in a folder, set up Docker, and I've got tools for breaking into passwords. I've got tools for attacking RDP. I've got tools for essentially everything, right? So mitigating the dangers of a brute force attack is relatively trivial. Hey. Sounds pretty good, right? A properly configured system can provide all of the tools necessary to prevent the general and continuous brute force attack that is normally run over the internet and targeted at any machine willing to accept a connection attempt. Again, for those of you who have your own servers, if you've ever tail f the logs on your server, you will see within a few minutes or even a few seconds of your server coming up online, you will start to see people trying to get in over SSH you will start to see people checking ports because it's automated. There are people who are running computers around the clock, mass scan, and just checking the internet, mapping it, seeing what's available, what's out there and what can I use. So let's talk about the first thing, two-factor authentication. Now, two-factor authentication can be used for SSH. Yeah, really. SFTP, WordPress and almost every connection that requires a login. If you are running SSH on your server, it is possible to add two-factor authentication to that server, and you can use an application and SSH into the box, pull out your cell phone, take a look at the randomly generating code, type that code in, and then get access to the box. One more defense against somebody being able to get in. And of course, we're going to go into SSH keys as well and how all of this stuff builds upon itself so that you can add layers of security. And I use this term in every single class that I talk about. This, it's layers. There is no silver bullet. There is no one tool 
that if we just install this single thing on my server, I don't have to worry about anybody else because it's like a golden cage that protects me against everything. It's just not out there. We're building layers upon layers over the top of all of our stuff. So you can add two-factor authentication to a server and then require a device to allow access, and this is going to help mitigate some threat actors because they will still be unable to log in, even with a username and password, if they do not have the one-time pass required. The two-factor authentication device will generate a key that must be used for login, and the main concept of two-factor authentication is something you have in the device and something you know in your password. And of course, when we're moving over here towards SSH keys, then we would have something we have, like in our device, and then something we also have in our SSH key, and then potentially also having our password for that SSH key. So any user who is going to log into a server over SSH, SFTP, or similar should do so using an SSH key that they generated and managed. They may also wish to add a password to the SSH key as well as use a strong password for using sudo. If you are using a password manager, your password should be 20, 30 characters long. You want to use the maximum length of password, and every single password should be original. Now, we're going to get into strong passwords here in a moment, but that's very important because we're building our layers. We are adding two-factor authentication. We are adding SSH. Uh, we are adding keys. And then, even after you get into the box, we are mitigating the threat of somebody getting in, and if they do not have the pseudo password, we're reducing the amount of damage that they can do. Again, layer after layer after layer. And there is some complexity to this. I will admit to it. There is. There is a level of complexity here that requires you to have proper documentation and proper management of all of these tools. And you have to put in time and effort for all of these items to work. So strong passwords. Let's just get it out of the way. You have to use a password manager. You have to. Nobody's going to remember 150 different passwords, all 30 characters long. I can't. I just, I can't. I physically cannot do that. It is not possible. I have in my password manager approximately 840 accounts. Okay? Right around there, last time I looked. For all the things I've ever signed up for, for all the different things that I've logged into, every server that I've ever logged into, I keep track of. So I have access to IP addresses. I know all of the keys that I've ever used, all of that stuff, just a ton of information. And it's all historical made available to me so that if I ever need to look back at any of this stuff, I can say, oh yeah, yeah, I know about that. So you should be using very strong passwords that include a random jumble of letters, numbers, and symbols, if possible. It's not always possible. There are still web pages out there that will tell you your password has to be exactly eight characters long, all lowercase, and it can only be A through Z. Seen them like that. So where possible, you want to employ both tools. In addition to that, I hope everybody is fully aware, if you have a choice between using a text message or using like a Google Authenticator, you should always use the Authenticator and not the text message. Because the text message opens you up to a completely different vulnerability in terms of if you are using text message for securing your device, somebody else is going to pick up the phone and call their contact at one of the phone companies and they are going to tell that person, hey look, send their text messages to this SIM card and they will get into the computer that you, or account that you have. They will send that information to their phone and they will get access to your data. And if you don't think that that's happening right now, Linus Tech Tips from YouTube, you can actually go on there and go look him up. They hit him just a couple of months ago. He, so he was sitting there making a video and his cell phone didn't ring, didn't go off, nothing happened because guess what? It didn't have a connection to the internet anymore. And the next thing he knows, somebody comes running in and interrupts the video filming to let him know that their Twitter had been taken over, a whole bunch of other uh, accounts had been attacked, and that somebody had access to his two-factor authentication because his two-factor 
authentication choice was a text message as opposed to an application. So if at all possible, avoid text message for authentication because even today, people are still able to get into those accounts. They will find a way into your cell phone account and it is not difficult when you think about it. If you pick up the phone and you make a phone call and you already have some pretty extensive information about people, it is not hard to impersonate that person. Uh, for those of you who have been on the internet lately, if you are familiar with Celebrity Gate, all the nude images that were leaked of different celebrities over the past couple of months, uh, a lot of that actually came from an original attack that happened to Paris Hilton's cell phone. Because her security question was, what's the name of my dog? It's Tinkerbell. And I know that because of the attack, not because I read the magazines. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> but somebody was able to pick up the phone, pretend to be her. They asked, what's your security key? What's the password? And she, that individual said, oh, it's Tinkerbell. And they said, yep, sure is. And they were able to send all of those celebrity phone numbers, all of their data, everything essentially from her cell phone was transferred over to another person's phone. And then that person used that information for all of their nefarious stuff and then leaked it out onto the internet and it's been used for other kinds of attacks now as well. And so it all started with that original attack and then sort of blossomed out from there. Because how many people here would think to themselves, oh, I have to change my entire identity if somebody else was attacked? You know, not everybody thinks about that. And that's what happened to these celebrities. You find a door in and once you get in, you pivot. Your attack moves based on where you're located and who's available to you. So we need to use a password manager. We need to use strong passwords. And we need to use stuff that people can't find out off of OSINT, which is open source intelligence, O-S-I-N-T. Your backup questions, your safety questions, should not be real information about you. When they ask you at a bank, what was the name of your mother's maiden name? None of your business, SpongeBob. Pick something else, okay? Find yourself something else. I use random characters. I just go into the password generator and I just generate a 30 character password and I have literally had to sit there and read it off character by character to somebody on the phone in order to get access to the thing. But you know what? It's none of their business. When they ask me, you know, what's your mother's maiden name? Guess what? <laughs> get ready to write this down. Because I don't want them to be able to go online, throw my name into Google, spend some time searching, and figure out what my mother's maiden name is and use it against me. Same thing for all of you, because it's that easy. OSINT is what it's called. So if you want to look into that, that's another term that you can write down for, for searching, open source intelligence. And guess what? It's used everywhere. Everybody uses OSINT. So every password needs to be unique. No two accounts should ever share a password. We should not give them any kind of information to pivot off of. That's extremely important. And we need to use some sort of password management. Now, I have two links on the web page, one for SASPass and one for KeePassX. I'm a huge KeePassX proponent. Love KeePassX. I tell people everywhere to use KeePassX. SASPass is pretty neat too, but this moves into you're not managing the data, somebody else is. When you put stuff into SASPass, potentially that's being sent up to a, a central account. And so now you're putting trust in somebody else. KeePass, you're really putting your trust in yourself. So you kind of have two choices here. And if you're just getting started with this kind of stuff, you need to make a decision, an informed decision about who you are on whether or not you can manage this. Is this information that you will protect? Is this some information that you will do regular backups on? Do you know to take care of this stuff? Because you do not want to have to recover 840 accounts because you lost literally everything. 
And then in addition to that, all your backup questions are 30 characters long, random jumbled letters and numbers. Okay? So you have to think into the future, am I going to take care of this information? Am I going to keep it safe? Am I going to be able to defend it? Am I ready for this? Of course, both of these products are available on your phone. They're available on your computer. There's different applications available for them. There's a whole bunch of stuff. And there's one other benefit about SAS Pass that I want to go over, and that's the fact that it will carry your OTP stuff. So like your Google Authenticator, you can put that into SAS Pass, and you'll have all of that available to you within essentially one application. Again, one more thing to think about as you start adding layers of security. How do you want to manage this stuff? Then we're going to move to fail to ban. Fail to ban is pretty neat. A lot of people know that fail to ban works for SSH, SFTP, things like that, but it also works for web application layer. So it's a log parser is essentially what it does. Fail to ban will parse logs, and it works by monitoring common services to recognize patterns in authentication and mitigate attacks. If you have something that writes to a log, you can essentially use fail to ban. You just need to be able to write the regex to sit there and look at the log, identify a pattern, and then tell it to take an action. That's all fail to ban does. Okay. So we can use fail to ban to monitor for attacks on SSH, SFTP. We can look for things that are attacking our WordPress sites. So we can tell it, if you see somebody attempting to access our web page at WP Admin, block that individual. Stop them. We can send them to null. We can do whatever it is that we want to do. And then later on in further classes, we'll also talk about honeypots, where we can actually set up a server designed specifically to get people to attack it so that we can sit there and let them get in and get far enough that we can watch what they're doing and we can monitor their actions. But right now, we just want to block them. Okay? So that's what we'll discuss here. And this, of course, works with WordPress, Drupal, any web application that you have. Again, if it writes a log, there's a way to parse that log, and you can see a pattern within the log, then this will work for you. And then we also have IP access control. We can limit access to the server by IP address, and we can make that a viable alternative to leaving our server open. So some individuals will employ a country-based list, essentially, I will go in there and I will collect all the African, Chinese, and Thailand IP addresses that are out there on the internet, IPv4. And then I will say, if any kind of connection tries to come from one of these IP addresses, just say no. You can't connect. My web page isn't for that country, or my web page isn't for uh, you know, anybody who's connecting from a certain language or anything like that. There's a, there's a large number of lists that you can go from. But there's really two types to IP access control. And that's the blacklist and the whitelist, or as I like to call it, the American list and the Soviet list. So a blacklist, or the American style, means that everything is permitted except that which is not. So the perfect example of the blacklist, anyone can connect to this computer unless I strictly forbid them. You can just make an SSH connection, and as long as you have a username and password, hey, you're good to go. And then we have the Soviet-style security. Nothing is permitted unless otherwise allowed. So the perfect example is the whitelist. No one can use this computer unless I give you explicit access to this computer by IP address, username, password. Obviously, Soviet-style is much easier to manage. Because if you are using the American style, you're going to find yourself with an exponentially growing list as people make active attacks on your system. Makes sense, right? So in addition to that, that whitelist is going to consist of a very small number of very carefully controlled addresses with access to that box. And since no other IP address can connect, it makes it much safer. Now that moves over towards using a VPN. Because we can also use a VPN to manage access. If a user can connect to that VPN that's hosted on the box, then they are already within the box. We can give them access to that internal 
network there. And then we can say connections to the box from within the box on that VPN are allowed. So anybody who doesn't have access to the VPN then, therefore, don't, does not have access to the box. Or you can do a mixture of both because some of us do end up in situations where potentially the VPN breaks. So we have a set number of IP addresses that can connect from the outside world. Everybody else must come through the VPN. Layers. All of these viable alternatives will be entirely based on your risk tolerance and your specific risk management plan. Obviously, if you have employees who travel the world and go to countries that are known for executing attacks, well, guess what? You may not be able to block those IP addresses. You may have to use a VPN because you already know for a fact that individual in question is going to be coming from one of those IP addresses and need access to that server. So you have to plan and think both about the future, how you want to handle it, what kind of additional work do you want to put into a system like this? Because again, the American style means that you're going to be spending time verifying those logs, verifying that the people who are blocked are correct. And if somebody does decide to try to log into your system three times within five minutes and keep putting in the wrong password and they block themselves out, well, guess what? You as an administrator may have to take time to go in there and rescue that person. Hey, I got to go edit this file or whatever to make sure that this person can get in. Yeah, that's rain. So that's all sort of basic, right? Passwords, password management. This is all stuff you've all heard before. Take care of your business. Be a good neighbor, make sure that you're taking care of your things. Well, now let's talk a little bit more about some of the other attacks that are available. Let's talk about a man-in-the-middle attack. So a man-in-the-middle attack is the method by which an individual is able to receive traffic intended for another party, build and sustain a connection with said party, and then act as a gateway between the party and their traffic. It just means that whatever data you're trying to send out to the internet, I want to intercept it, be able to work with that data before you get to do anything with it, and then send it on its way without you ever knowing that I was there. That's the whole point of a man in the middle attack, okay? If you can successfully gain a foothold between a user and their traffic, you can potentially tamper with their data and they will be normally unaware of your presence. So let's talk about art poisoning. An attack on the lookup table of a router that changes the contents and remaps IP addresses to MAC addresses is called an art poisoning attack. If you are able to modify the entries in the table, you can then receive all of the traffic intended for another party. You can have stuff swing through your computer before it goes somewhere else. Okay? An ARP attack will generate an increased amount of traffic and be spotted easily by active monitoring solutions. So if your target has an IDS, intrusion detection system, in place, they will quickly discover your attack. So you should also be cautious if you try to ARP spoof an entire subnet as your hardware might not be able to handle the increased traffic. Keep that in mind as well. You could potentially be limited by whatever hardware it is that you're using. Um, famous tool that a lot of people is probably familiar with. Uh, anybody remember Droid Sheep? No? Droid Sheep, it was an Android for your phone. You can sit there and hit a button and immediately start man in the middling anybody who wasn't using HTTPS traffic just off of your cell phone. This is, man, this is probably five to eight years ago at least. I don't even know if people still use that. But uh, another tool is EtherCAP. And I'll open this real quick. And of course, here is our GitHub for EtherCAP. And you can head in here and there are plenty of instructions. Now, if you notice here, I'm not using Docker for EtherCAP, and there's a reason for that. And it has to do with the way that Docker requires access to your system in order for EtherCAP to run successfully, okay? And we will get into that, but I wasn't comfortable sending out an EtherCAP image, like, out into the world with this being a potential issue until either I sit down and actually make my own EtherCAP image 
or somebody trustworthy to me does as well. So EdderCap has two forms. You can get a graphical user interface or you can get a command line. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about the graphical user interface because it's really easy to use. Once you start EdderCap, and of course this is for like Debian and Ubuntu based, there's a couple of app gits up here. Set up your app gits. Uh, start the tool. You can go to sniff, unified sniffing, choose your interface and hit OK and you're up and running. Then all you have to do is set it up for hosts. You scan for your hosts and then you can get a host list and you can actually see all the IP addresses that are on the network. Okay? And then you sit there and you choose off of that list of what IP addresses you want to poison, send them over to the targets list, and then you can start man in the middle, art poisoning, and then sniff the remote connections and hit OK. That fast. Super easy. I mean, you can literally sit down with that thing and using this text right here off of that graphical user interface, you really can't mess this up. And if you want to test the attack, on your box just type ARP, switch A, hit enter, and as long as you're running like a Win or, uh, Linux or a Macintosh, like a FreeBSD style box with ARP-A, you can actually look and see essentially what devices believe you to be where it needs to route traffic. So Docker can be used with EdderCap and the supporting tools that are necessary for EdderCap, all of them can be put into an image. And there are some Docker images, however, they require privilege mode. You have to give them a lot of access to your system and I don't feel comfortable doing that. So if you are interested in building a Docker image, that would be fantastic. Another complaint that I would like to field here for all of you, if you're interested in this kind of stuff and you're practicing it and you start building your own Docker images, think of ways to reduce the size of some of these images. When you install WP Scan or you install InCrack or further on down when we start getting to web application security and we start dealing here in a moment uh, with some of the other Docker images that I list here, just take a look at how big they are. These images are monstrous because they're essentially installing full operating systems with all supporting stuff. I mean, applications, everything. I mean, it's a full OS install to get one single application running. Super ridiculous. So, I guess here in the middle of it all, you know, call to action if you decide you want to take some time. Work on reducing the size of some of these Docker images. And of course, I do mention, since it does need access to the hardware, if you're going to make an image and run it in Docker, great, make it yourself. Be careful running somebody else's image, especially when you start moving into privilege mode. So web application security. Now we're starting to get into web pages. How are we doing on time? OK. Web application security is very delicate because historically you trade usability for security. The safer something is, the less likely normal users are going to be able to effectively use said tool without some sort of hand holding or explanation or assistance. Okay? That's just sort of a rule of thumb that you're juggling the ability for somebody to just step in and start using your web application or your website or your forum or whatever versus, hey, I need to make sure that this is a controlled environment and whatever these folks are doing on my controlled environment, I have an eye on. Uh, a major flaw that many websites still to this day suffer from is SQL injection. And any application you write should be designed to take advantage of best, best practices in SQL to prevent SQL injection. And I'm going to show you some examples of SQL injection and we're going to discuss it here in a moment. This is a little PHP example of SQL injection. But for those of you who don't know what SQL injection is, the entire concept is if I'm taking in user input or you have some way of interacting with my SQL, 
I need to make sure that your input is trusted and sane. So I need to clean it, I need to verify it, I need to make sure that it makes sense, and only then can I use whatever it is that you are sending me. In addition to that, there are some pre-generated or uh, pre-designed you know, functions that are available out there in order to handle a lot of this for you and to prevent people from doing this. Uh, you will hear the term prepared statements. And so we'll get into that here in a moment. But let's look. What am I really talking about here? So making this a little bit bigger here. That top line right there says unclean input, and that's a post request. If you're not a web developer, a post request is a way for a user who's using a web browser to be able to send me, the webmaster, information. That's all. Okay? And me on the server end can capture that post request and then take a look at it. It's like having a conversation. That that basic, okay? I have a way for you to put a little bit of text into a box and hit submit, and then somewhere on my server, it's waiting for that information to come on over. That right there is a raw post request. That means that I'm not checking anything. I'm not inspecting. I'm not taking care of that information in any way. I'm just expecting you as the user to do the right thing, which I think all of us can agree that's probably not the best idea. And then I have a query that I have built right here where I want to do a select from a user's table. And all I'm doing is a selection by ID number, and I'm using that unclean input, raw, straight in that SQL. So again, I went to you and I said, hey, what's your ID? And you look at me and say, well, actually, it's 1 equals 1, also maybe 5. So when you do that, if you put a true statement into SQL, you can oftentimes trick it into just selecting everything. Because what we're doing here is select star, star from users where ID equals whatever I said. So if I did where ID equals 1 or 1 equals 1, either one, then just select everything and return it to me. Therefore, I get access to the entire database. Right there, your users and everything that's saved within that table gets dumped out to me, and I have access to it. Now, for those of you who do web development, most of us are probably thinking to ourselves, well, I use prepared statements and I keep an eye out for this stuff, and that's great. That's fantastic. You should. That's all things that you should be doing. However, we have to be ever, vigil ever vigilant that potentially somebody's going to find a way to send something into the system to get that information. Uh, I like to say that data is toxic. And one of my examples for that is there was a toy company that made a little teddy bear. And the teddy bear recorded the children. They would play with the little bear. And as they played with it and talked to it, it would record them. And then it would gather that information up and it would send it back to the toy company. And they kept images. They kept video. They kept sound clips. They kept all of this information about the child as they played with the toy. And then people were able to get into that database and gain access to that information. It's kind of creepy. Why is it kind of? <laughs> What's that? She said it's kind of creepy. I said, why kind of? Yeah. It, in my opinion, that's pretty disgusting, to be honest with you. That data, that's toxic data. You don't need that. That is not something that your company needs. That's not something that you should be using. And of course, this is my opinion, and I'm just some dude. Like, what do I know, right? However, in my opinion, that is toxic data that does not need to be collected. Because guess what? Who actually used it? the individuals who gained illicit access to that database and started pulling this stuff down. They're the ones who got access to that data. And at no time should that data have ever been saved. And if you go to other web pages 
and you start looking around and you start thinking about all of the stuff that they need, this goes back to when I discussed entropy in one of the previous talks where I discussed the fact that we only need 33 bits of entropy to find out who you are, to unmask you so you are no longer anonymous on the internet. You don't need somebody's gender. You generally don't need a date of birth. There's a lot of information that people collect for no other reason than to have it. And then once they have that data, they don't take care of it. And I disagree with that tremendously. I think that that's incorrect. And our thought process towards what kind of data we give out has to fundamentally change. And when we get into social engineering, I'm going to talk about that as well, because we're just sort of building over and over and over. Because their attacks are layered just like our defense is layered. So again, here's that SQL query, all in its glory right there. Select from users where ID equals 1 or 1 equals 1. As easy as that. One raw post, and I have access to the entire user database. And there are plenty of people out there who have applications that they have access to that will go through your site and look for every single input and every spot where you can put data in and just randomly put different potential SQL injection attacks just to enumerate through the site in an attempt to find out if it's vulnerable somewhere. And it doesn't take long to automate this stuff. Not at all. There is not a singular person sitting around frantically typing 1 equals 1, 1 equals 1, 1 equals 1 over and over and over inside of your web page. They have a script, okay? And of course, mitigation for SQL, the only mitigation that I can give you is the hope that if you are a developer or a programmer or you deal with those people, then you know to let them know, hey, you need to follow best practices. You need prepared statements. You need to do the right thing whenever you're building. Because if you're not doing that, you're potentially bringing harm to us, our customer base, you know, the company, or just the family, whatever. Whatever level of relationship you have with that person, they need to understand that whatever it is that they are doing out there on the internet, they need to make sure that they're doing the right thing. I like to use the good neighbor policy, not only with your server, but also with your computer programming. You've got to be a good neighbor. So moving forward into social engineering. So we've cracked some SSH passwords. We've cracked the WordPress site. We know what is vulnerable on the site. We know what plugins you're not updating because you don't have any way to automatically update those plugins. But in addition to that, now that I've looked at the company and I got a good idea of, all right, not the best security practices. It's obviously not everybody here is trained. But I know for a fact that they do business with another company where they're cutting checks in the $50,000 to $100,000 range every couple of, oh, I don't know, every couple of months. Now it's time to start doing the spear fishing and the whale fishing and figuring out who's valuable and who I really want to get and whose account we really want access to because I'm going to want to be able to pretend to be that person so I can get them to send me a check. Because guess what? That's what they're doing. So. Social engineering is the use of deception or manipulative behavior in order to force an individual to reveal confidential information that can be used for fraudulent purposes. Now, this is sort of old, but I like old technology. For those of you who know me, I love to play with like Commodore 64 and BASIC and, you know, 10, print, hello world, 20, go to 10, right? Yep, loop, love it, love all of that. So let's talk about Frank William Abagnale, Abagnale Jr. He spent time in the 1960s pretending to be a pediatrician. Worked as a pediatrician. Guess what? He was not a pediatrician. All right? He worked as one. But he was not a pediatrician. All he knew to do was to carry around a medical book so he could reference that thing by running to the bathroom. If somebody asked him a question, He'd head on over to the bathroom and real quick look it up and then come back out and he was an expert. Okay? And then we have Kevin Mitnick. This one's probably more knowledge 
more people would know who Kevin Mitnick is than they would know who Frank is. So Kevin Mitnick spent a little time in prison and was believed to be able to whistle and make missiles launch. The judge put him in solitary confinement and refused to allow him to use a telephone because they were terrified that if he whistled into the phone, the entire US nuclear arsenal would just whoo, launch out into space. Okay? They were terrified of this guy. He runs a successful business now, so I guess he's doing okay. So, and then I want to talk about the best social engineer in recorded history, ever. And that's Mark Zuckerberg. Because you have nearly 400 million people who have provided you with their most intimate data. Good job. You're doing it, man. You're living the life. If anybody's doing social engineering, it's old Mark. Isn't two billion now? What's that? Isn't two billion now in Facebook? Oh, I'm sure. It's, it's a massive number. But I'm sure also some of those are like duplicates and then in addition to that, you probably have people who like play role playing games and stuff. I've seen that. So it's a lot of information you have to go through. So let's talk about the social engineering toolkit. And of course, I got links. We always keep links, right? Oop. If it'll open, there we go. And the, the social engineering toolkit is available off of Cali as well. And we'll get to that because that is part of our learning objectives. But there's a really nice breakdown through Cali with really good instructions. So if you're interested in this tool, really, really easy to go over. Okay. And lo and behold, guess what? Docker image. Now I'm going to tell you this is probably the biggest Docker image out of the entire group. This legit installs an entire copy of Cali inside of a Docker image to get access to one piece of software. That is super ridiculous. Okay. However, hey, think of it like homework. Somebody can go home and say, I can do that better and whip up a Docker image that doesn't require us to pull down an entire copy of Kali to run what amounts to like 38 megabytes, maybe tops. But you can run docker run dash it dash p, give it some ports, and then uh, the Warch Social Engineering Toolkit. And it'll come right up for you. And in addition to that, I like the fact that with Docker, uh, one of the nice things is whenever we're done with it, if we don't need it anymore, of course we can destroy it and just get rid of it. So that's always nice. Or you can go to Git and just clone it, set it up in the SET folder, Social Engineering Toolkit. Put it in there and just work with it off of there. And of course, I've got our install stuff for it. Go into the um, directory, sudo python setup, and then sudo python se toolkit. It actually has to run a whole bunch of stuff, and that's kind of why I would prefer to have that in a Docker image, because it doesn't require um, any kind of elevated stuff outside of Docker, but it does require to run under sudo. So if you put it inside of Docker, it just kind of gives you that, that buffer between you. So I prefer that. Once you do that, you can launch the SE toolkit, and it gives you a plethora of stuff that you can work with, especially for those of us who work in cybersecurity and have to deal with like testing. Some of us uh, actually have to test our employees and give them like a little, hey, this is a, this is a scam. Make sure you don't click the button, everybody, and keep a track of who clicked the button. This is a great tool for being able to automate a system like that. Because with this, you can go in and you can boot this thing up and you can go to your web page or PayPal or MasterCard or whoever and you hit one key and you will get a copy of that web page. You can spider that entire page and you can have a copy and then it's local to your machine. So you have all the CSS, you have all of the data that you need in order to make a copy of that image. And there are, of course, other tools for being able to do this. But this is sort of a one-stop shop because in addition to that, you can automatically tell it to go ahead and inject specific exploits or to use Metasploit, and it takes care of all of that for you. So back in the day, we used to have to do it by hand, like you know, trudge up the mountain in the snow both ways. But nowadays, you just really have a way to create a Docker image, hit a couple of keys, give it a URL, and you're in. Um, 
when I was looking at some of the tutorials, I really liked the fact that they said that if you can use a Chinese food menu, you can successfully use the toolkit. It's numbered, okay? I need number one, I need number seven, and I need number 10, and hit the button, and then you're done, okay? It's very, very simple. It's easy to follow, very detailed instructions, but that's sort of what makes it so powerful is the fact that it doesn't take anything to make copies of stuff and to make those web pages that you see where they tell you, yeah, put in your information here or we're gonna shut down your Discover card. Those emails, all of that can be generated here. In addition to that, it takes templates, so you can either build your own templates or you can use the templates that are provided. Uh, it's a one-stop shop. And this is particularly good for those of you in this room who do have to deal with employees that you're gonna have to send these kind of tests to to verify that they're within you know, that knowledge base that they need to be at. Uh, it's, it's pretty neat, it really is. And I like the fact that it fits on Docker, but I do wish the image was smaller. Digital extortion, let's touch on crime, okay? Because we've been talking about the tools and we've been talking about some of the, the stuff that they're using, but why? Why is this stuff worth people's time? Why are we spending time together on a Tuesday night trying to figure out how to defend against this? So digital extortion is a relative newcomer that is sweeping the world when it comes to crime. Individuals are able to demand payment in return for access to services and data from anywhere in the world. Regardless of operating system, there are a multitude of attacks that can be executed in order to find financial gain and others suffering or loss. And some of these scams do not even require a successful attack, okay? A little ingenuity and a well-worded email or advertisement and some people will pay out of fear or shame without complaint. This is the FBI. You owe us $10,000 in tickets. Send me money, but only a Bitcoin. Okay. The first one though, distributed denial of service. Big money maker. DDoS is being used for ransom and this attack and using it for ransom is on the rise. Many companies are unwilling to reveal the threat and regularly try to hide any mention of an attack. If I can give you all a recommendation, hiding that you've been attacked until the attacker comes forward and says I pwn these people, ha 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 and also here's my evidence does not make you look good it does not that is poor form it is extremely poor form and i understand that there is a fear of backlash from investors there is a fear that you will not be able to gain capital but i will tell you right now within the security com community of people who actually work on this stuff and look at these things and deal with this kind of stuff there is a lot more honor in standing up and saying yeah i got punched in the face but i'm back up on my feet than there is in trying to hide it until the bad guy comes forward and says, yeah, here's your whole database and also here's pictures of the inside of your house. Okay? Just keep that in mind. These companies are paying big bucks in secret to extortion teams who are keen to get on the payroll. And companies are regularly the target of nefarious actors willing to turn undefended infrastructure into a weapon. Mirai Botnet, Everybody knows the name, Inf uh, Internet of Things, little tiny devices all over your house, everywhere. All of that stuff is worth something. They send them out with passwords like root root, you know, and then next thing you know, somebody has access to it. They're setting it up to repeatedly curl request somebody's web page. And the next thing you know, somebody's knocking on your door to let you know, hey, we're shutting down your internet because your house is being used in a DDoS attack. So it started off with things like convincing people to use low orbit ion cannon. Hey, all you gotta do is put in a URL into this box and hit attack, nuke it from orbit, ha ha ha. And guess what, a lot of those people who were using that tool, the FBI came in, kicked in the door and even took their microwave. Yep, because it had a computer in it and it, it stings. turn off your refrigerator, all sorts of stuff. They do, uh, if you go back to some of that like 
activist prime time and you look at some of the things that happened to some of those kids that were like, yeah, I was sitting at my grandma's house and I heard that we were rebelling against the man. And so I went ahead and threw in a URL and hit attack and forgot about it overnight. And a month or two later, somebody was in and boom, there they are. Here comes the FBI knocking on the door, taking everything from grandma's house. Because it was just part of the investigation. So DDoS, botnets, all of this stuff, there are people out there cruising around looking for an opportunity to take your server offline, attack your stuff, and put you into a position where later on they're going to come in and they're going to say, hey, look, if you want your customers to not suffer any longer, you pay us X amount of money and we'll ease up. And there are plenty of people out there in the world doing this right now. Also, sextortion. This is important too. Digital blackmail or sextortion. And again, I got a link up there, so if you want to follow it through, you can go read about it. Really interesting article about some people who were arrested for this, and they actually caught these folks, okay? But digital blackmail or sextortion is on the rise. There are individuals who use tools like Tinder, Skype, all these communication tools, and they say, hey, you're super cute. You want to hook up on the computer? This is a picture of me. I'm a model. I'm super hot. What do you say? And people go, oh, yeah, sounds good. I'm pretty handsome myself, actually. And the next thing you know, they're sitting there in front of their webcam doing things that they probably shouldn't have been doing, letting this person film them, telling them their name, telling them where they live, giving them what, not just a show, it's called OSINT, okay? Open source intelligence, everything that they need to go find this person. And the next thing they know, they get a little email that says, hey, here's a couple of clips of you doing some silly things in front of your webcam. I'm gonna go show it to your mom, I'm gonna show it to your cousin, I'm gonna go show it to your boss, I'm gonna go show it to your dog, I'm gonna show it to anybody who will look, or you're gonna give me some bitcoins. Now, I say this stuff and we kind of joke about it in here, but this is actually pretty serious. One of the reasons why they pursued this group in particular is because many of their victims went out of their way to go kill themselves. They ended their own lives because of this crime, okay? So this is a real threat. This is an actual danger, all right? There are people who are victims to this that cannot handle it. And I know some of us are sitting here and we're thinking to ourselves, you know what, if somebody sent me an email like that, I'd just write my boss and be like, you know what, boss, I screwed up. And if you want a copy of the video, you hit me up first. You know, when we're looking at it from 100 yards, we can think to ourselves, yeah, I'm pretty tough. But for some people, it's not like that. It was a major embarrassment to the point that they could not handle it. They chose a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So it's important that you're educated about these things, that you understand what they're doing. This crime is prevalent in the Philippines. It's a big time in the Philippines right now. I'm talking there are people who have made enough money out there in the Philippines that they're buying entire neighborhoods. The lady who was arrested essentially bought an entire block and set up her own internet cafe where she brought in 13 and 14 year old girls to become essentially sexual predators where they would go out and look for people to convince, to show themselves or to participate in group video chats, get them recorded and then use it to, hey, care to the stick bud, which one do you want? So after she earned millions of dollars, and I'm sorry, I was incorrect, she employed girls as young as 12. Uh, they did catch her though, they did execute an arrest Something to keep in mind, okay? They don't need to break into your system. Somebody just has to be smart enough to make you make a mistake. If you're not careful with what you're doing, if you're not thinking things through, you can very quickly become a victim without them ever gaining physical access to your machine. Because that's sort of the cool thing, right? 
the, the hacking, the physical access, the, the tactile thing. But sometimes it's not about that. Sometimes it's just about having a little bit more knowledge than the other person or just a, to be a little bit more vicious. That's the only requirement. And then we have the big one that's always in the news. This, one, the, this is the one that gets talked about a lot. <clears throat> like a whole lot. Sorry. So ransomware is software that can encrypt files and also work as a control system to force users to contact the locker in order to receive the unlocked credentials for payment. Most ransomware works using Bitcoin as the intermediary tool for financial transactions between the criminal and the victim. Warning. Do y'all do y'all see that? Warning. Okay, for real reals, not for play plays. <laughs> that right there is a link to a GitHub with an actual functional attack. However, in the README, you can get the password for it, okay? But please do not experiment with that, especially not here. And don't go home and tell people that you learned how to lock up your computer and now you can't open it up because you went to this thing. There is a huge warning right there. In addition to that, for the Linux encoder one, I did not add a link to that, but that text is right there and y'all know what to do. If you don't know what to do, it's copy and paste into like a search engine. Okay. Just, <laughs> just, just in case. So, <laughs> ransomware's it's in the news. Everybody knows about it, okay? We all know about it. But it's a big deal because they're making a lot of money off of this. And ransomware exists no matter what your operating system is. Some of us use Mac and Linux. Some of us have Windows computers, and some of us are even on FreeBSD, but really it doesn't matter, okay? Because there are variants out there with varying level of effectiveness. Some of them are real easy to crack, and that's great. Some of them, people go in there and they take a look at it and they say, oh yeah, okay, you just encrypted all of my hard drive, but no big deal, because I, I have a way to break this encryption simply because they didn't encrypt the files correctly. That exists, that's out there. But let's not rely on that, okay? That is not a thing to rely on in the hopes that, well, if this person screws up, when they get my data, eh, no big deal. I don't care. This also exists for iOS, Android, your phones. There are ways that you can end up with your phone locked. Now, typically, uh, and I know there's some people in the audience that I can see right here that aren't going to like the statement. But typically, you will find these vulnerabilities in the phones in Android. And typically, it's against users who are rooted. Now, not all of them require your phone to be rooted. There are some that can exploit bugs or uh, remote code execution in order to get root access to the phone and lock it, even if your phone is not rooted. There have been some exploits like that, and it is possible. But the easiest way to do it is to find somebody using a rooted Android phone and then exploit that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about mitigation here. And I'm going to give some personal recommendations on this. But your mileage is going to vary. And it's also going to vary with your job. And I do understand that as starry-eyed as I am and how much I like to think that we'll all come together and we're all going to work together to make sure that everything's more secure and when somebody gets hit, that person's going to say, hey, this is how I got hit and here's an exact breakdown of it so that nobody else gets hit. That doesn't really happen in the real world. That's much rarer than for somebody to be like, oh, man, we just took a huge blow, but let's hope that we don't tell nobody that maybe they won't find out. The number one thing, talk to your data center. If you know that there's a threat coming or you are warned, hey, we're going to lock all your stuff or hey, we're going to DDoS you, you better start getting that money together. 
You better head on out there to trade for some bitcoins because we're going to get you. And you better have that money ready when we show up. They send emails out like that all the time. Your number one thing is to discuss with your data center your options because your data center potentially has ways of mitigating this stuff that maybe isn't turned on due to cost saving reasons that they could flip on in the event of a problem. You go into battle mode, the fight, right? Train like you fight, fight like you train. We have an emergency. I know what to expect. I know what's going to happen. I know what to look for. I know what's about to come at me, so I need to take X actions. Now, we may not be able to pre prevent or expect every single contingency. We might not know exactly what's coming, but we can have a pretty good idea if we understand the attacks. What are people doing? How are they pointing that at us? And then how can we react? So talk to your data center, because they probably know. They're managing hundreds, if not thousands, of companies, and they've probably seen it before. Hey, I got this letter. It says that they're going to send a 500 kilobyte per second DDoS. Hey, they can't all be funny. So <laughs> they're going to send a DDoS at me. I need to be ready for it. What do I do? Hey, you know what? For an extra 10 bucks a month, we'll flip on Cloudflare for you. Oh, OK, cool. You never know. Number two, don't pay the ransom. Don't do it. When you start paying the ransom, that means that you are not prepared. Get prepared. Have backups. Have contingency plans. Be ready. Know what to do in the event of an emergency. And I'm sure you've all seen it before. They send out documentation that says, in the event of an emergency, have some water, have some food. You know, have all of these things in your home so that you're prepared for a problem. It's the exact same thing right here. Be prepared. Don't pay the ransom. Be ready for whatever it is that's coming. You can also contact law enforcement. FBI has a cyber crime group. Your local law enforcement group has like computer crimes units, things like that. You can contact them. They may not be as helpful right now, but we're definitely working on trying to turn that around. They are starting to really catch people. If you've been watching the news, uh, a gentleman just went away for one of the longest computer crime sentences ever. They're going after folks, and they're finding them in other countries. So it does not hurt to communicate with your law enforcement. It's a good idea, actually. Let them know what you're experiencing. Keep them in the loop. I link to the FBI cybercrime because this will be out on the internet, and there'll be people from all over the country that, uh, or the world, potentially, who will be looking at this. You got to understand, you know, depending on where you live, your local law enforcement may not be able to help you, but somebody like the FBI may be able to. Employ DDoS mitigation tools, and personally, I think Cloudflare is a good potential start. It's personal opinion, but they have a pretty neat product, and it does some pretty neat things, and it's a good start. Now, of course, if your business is large enough, or your web page has enough traffic, potentially you may not be able to use this. You may need to use something else. You may be looking for some sort of CDN, even something potentially that you put out there yourself. Some kind of content delivery network to load balance everything and to protect yourself. Obviously, that's going to get into more money. And really, that's what DDoS is about. That's what any kind of denial of service about is if I have an attack, can I make that attack large enough that you can't outspend me? If you look at Krebs on security, if you look on, at Schneier, there are a lot of people who go out there and donate CDN access. They donate money. They donate time. They do all of this stuff for these guys to keep them up and running. And the only reason why they're up and running is because those individuals are expending enough time, effort, and cash to keep these people up. But there was points where the DDoS was large enough, especially when Mirai first came out. That DDoS attack was big enough that everybody dropped these guys. Okay, Everybody stepped away. It took Google stepping in and being like, you know what, we're going to take a shot at it just because we've never seen an attack this big, and we want to take it straight to the chin to see if we can do it. Somebody had to put in the effort. But I'll tell you right now, most of us, especially within this room, wouldn't be able to afford 
to mitigate an attack like that. We just couldn't do it. You can't outspend something that large. Hey, number six, don't pay the ransom. Don't do it. Get your backups. Get ready. Be prepared. Have a mission statement. Hey, public, I apologize, but the Club Penguin fan club is going to be down for a couple of days because of an attack. It's going to happen. Sorry. We can't afford to pay tens of thousands of dollars on an hourly basis to keep this web page up to service all 18 of you. So as soon as they decide that we're not worth it anymore, we'll be right back up and running again. Don't pay the ransom. Hey, number seven, back up your files. And then protect those backups. Don't make backups available from your potentially infected computers because most attacks are opportunistic. So don't make it easy on them. Do not make a backup and then store it on the exact same computer that you're using to surf the internet that could potentially be infected. Because guess what happens to your backups? They get infected. And it happens all the time. Do not make your backups available from the machines that you are backing up. And it sounds like an easy concept, but people forget. When you are traversing a network, if I am in a box and I have access to your network and I'm inside your house and I'm starting to wrap stuff up in tape, don't put your backups inside the box that I'm going to wrap up. It's that easy. But a lot of people forget this. You have to make sure that your data is safely segregated away from the network so that somebody can't get access to it. It's imperative, OK? Can't say it enough. And you know what? I'm going to throw in a number nine in there. Don't pay the ransom. So now we're going to move towards Kali Linux. Backtrack Linux is no longer maintained. For those of you who are my students, sometimes you will hear me say backtrack because I'm old like that. I say backtrack. But backtrack really doesn't exist anymore. OK? Kali Linux is sort of the new hotness. And it is an operating system. And of course, I have a link to it. So if you want to follow that, that's fine. But really, it's just like, you know, it's like a cool web page. And it's got images of dragons and stuff. So you know they're serious. <laughs> so keep in mind. So Kali Linux is the operating system of choice for individuals looking for a system that is pre-configured for executing attacks. That's all it is. Okay? It's got a whole bunch of software already installed on it. It's based off of Debian. So if you know how to use apt and you are familiar with like Ubuntu or Debian, you kind of already know how to use this thing. However, this is not a daily driver. You do not get in this thing and set it up on your laptop and this becomes your daily driver because it is inherently insecure. It is open for the sole purpose of executing attacks. You don't live in this thing, OK? Does it, everybody follow? Cool. You don't live in this. So Kali Linux and the Kali Linux project is an open source operating system that is maintained and funded by offensive security. And the Kali Linux OS is based on Debian. And it is my opinion that users should use Kali Linux as an example of what is possible but should not rely on this system as a crutch. Nothing installed in Backtrack or Kali is not available to an Ubuntu or Debian user. Docker, other tools. Kali is a great example. I consider it like looking at art. You go in and you look at something that somebody else chiseled and made and formed, and then you use that to inspire yourself. You design your own stuff based off of what somebody else has, standing on the shoulders of giants, right? It's that easy. However, so I'm going to make another comment here, and this is 100% purely my personal opinion. And for those of you who are my students, you have heard this a thousand times, because a thousand times I've been asked, what about Cali? Back in the day, it was very popular for the media to refer to very small 
handguns as Saturday night specials. And they said the Saturday night special was the bad thing. It was always in the news. It was the, the weapon of choice for bad guys. They had a Saturday night special. It was constantly in the news. It was constantly in the newspapers. It was everywhere. Everybody knew about the Saturday night special. What was it? I don't know. Nobody knew. But it was a good term because it was scary. And it was a way of making people feel a very specific way about a very specific tool. And you didn't even have to describe anything about that tool. You just needed that terminology there to evoke an emotion, right? In the event that you, as a penetration tester, as you working with a business, as you doing any number of things, potentially in a business like this, you could end up in court. You could end up on a stand. It could happen, OK? Uh, somebody hires you to do a penetration test, and you don't fill out the documentation correctly, and you do something to break something, and the next thing you know, you're getting sued. I think of Cali as something to inspire me, to show me what I can do with these tools. However, I also think in front of a jury of my peers or in front of a judge who is not necessarily computer literate, they're going to see dragons. They're going to see hacker stuff. They're going to see zero cool. They're going to see all of these things, and they're not going to see a person. You don't want the Saturday night special of computers when you're standing there and having to defend yourself against somebody saying, look at all these dragons on this computer. This person's hardcore. They got to go. Something to keep in mind. It's a personal opinion. But for every single one of my students, I always tell them, take your inspiration, work with it. Work with your art. Build from it. But don't sit inside of something like that, especially when you're using it for business or you're using it out there in the, the real world, and potentially hamstring yourself if you ever have to get up in front of somebody and explain what you were doing. Just food for thought, OK? So here's some of the answers. So identify at least three types of attack vectors, brute force attacks, tools like WP scan, in crack, tons and tons of tools there, right? Uh, man in the middle attacks, started with EDRCAP. Social engineering, the social engineering uh, toolkit. We can talk about DNS poisoning. Those are also some attacks. Identify a piece of software that can be used to execute a brute force attack. WP scan can be used to brute force a WordPress site. Identify what the main concept of two-factor authentication is. Two-factor's main concept is something you have and something you know. If I have a phone with some codes in it, something I have. It's generating the codes inside of like Google Authenticator. And then of course I have my password or I have my uh, SSH key or whatever else. But I have two methods of being able to access that information. Identify a Linux operating system that is used for penetration testing. Hey, look at that. Kali Linux is an OS that can be used for penetration testing. Identify a product used to manage two-factor authentication. SASPass is a product that provides acceptable two-factor management. There are, of course, other ones. Google Authenticator, SASPass. Uh, there's an endless number of them. Pick your device. Pick what you like. Pick what you know how to use and employ it. But the most important part is you get started doing it. And then identify a training ethos that will make users more likely to stay safe. Train like you fight, and you will fight like you train. And that is an ethos practiced by cybersecurity experts as well as others, people who work in law enforcement. We don't train against imaginary stuff. There isn't a class that you go to to learn how to fight space aliens, just in case. That's not a concern. Believe it or not, right? I see, some, I see some disbelief out there in the crowd. But believe it or not, they actually train against things that they expect could potentially actually happen. That is what you need to be doing. Could somebody potentially try to brute force your WordPress site? Yeah, they could. Could they potentially attempt to break into your SSH server? Yes, they could. 
is some kind of space alien from a foreign planet going to try to come in through the wall and everybody's got to be able to fight it off with chairs? Probably not so much. It's not something that you're going to practice for. So we need to remember, no software, no tool, nothing is free of vulnerabilities. In my classes, I always tell them, my students, learn the tool and then learn how the tool can hurt you. How can this tool be used against you? Okay? When you are learning these concepts, it's not just about learning how to use said tool. How can you use it against somebody? If I learn how to curl, what can I do with curl? Well, I can write a script in Bash, and I can thread, and then I can start sending curl requests over and over and over again, and then I've written a brute forcer, depending on whatever it is that I'm going after. So curl is a neat tool to be able to post some information or pull something down off the internet or even make a download. But in addition to that, I can put it in a script and within a few moments, I can be iterating through a list of passwords that I downloaded, 24 gigabytes worth, and executing curl attacks. Fast, easy. So we as security professionals and programmers and end users must manage the risk as we see fit or to standard as appropriate for our position. It is impossible to plan for every contingency or weakness, but we can plan to provide ourselves with the greatest number of security layers. That term. So you should employ best practices, appropriate user management, and monitor for threats on a regular basis. You must also be prepared to react when the system is attacked and a database or other data is compromised. We can manage our security. We cannot manage the security of the products we use. Prepare for the worst. We can look and we can say, hey, I'm ready in the event that something happens, I get crypto lockered. Well, guess what? I have backups, and those backups are not on my network. I make regular incremental backups, and I can recover. Perhaps I lost a day. Perhaps I lost a week, depending on how often you need to do this and how important your data is. But you can prepare. You can be confident, and you can reduce some of the worry on you. If you get ready today, when the stuff happens, when it really goes down and you're in the fight, if you've already trained for it and you've prepared for it, you know what's going to happen, and then you can just do. And it's natural. Your body will take over. It's that quick. I look and I see in my emails that a Bitcoin web page that I have an account on has been broken into. And I looked around online at some of the usual suspects and I didn't see anything listed, so I know it's a recent attack. And what did they do? Somebody sent an email from that web page pretending to be the web page saying, hey, here's a Word document, right? Like I'm going to use Word. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, I'm straight Vim. Vim all, all day. Vim and Pandoc, okay? That's it. So they sent me a Word document and said, when you get into this document, you will have to accept like some Google stuff and then we'll eventually deliver you some Bitcoin. And it wasn't very readable. You could tell somebody was trying really hard. And I identified the attack immediately, but it also gives me a little bit of information in terms of, well, I know that this web page has been broken into. I know somebody had access to the database. And I know that my email address was plain text because now they're using it. They're sending me stuff that's showing up in my spam. Okay? But when I saw that, I immediately knew what happened. It wasn't a thing that I had to think about or I didn't click on anything, nothing. I immediately, my reaction was, all right, I'm being fished. They have my information. Where did the information come from? Oh, look, let's take a look at the email. I know where I use this email to register because I use different emails for every site. So I know, and for those of you who don't know, you can actually, if you have like a Gmail account, which I use as like my burner. So if you have a, a Gmail account, you can add a plus and then a little bit of text after. And Gmail will actually take the text that's between the plus and the at symbol and it'll leave it there. But it doesn't actually like do anything with it. So you can have Aaron plus Bitcoin forum full of janky people at gmail.com. And then I can register with that and it'll send data to that. And then I can see where I got attacked because I have a different email address for every single attack or for every single account. 
So if somebody gets hacked, I know where that hack came from because I can see somebody attempting to make an attack at me using a specific email address that was only shared with a specific company. And of course, that also counts for companies that say, we don't share your data, but they really do. So then you can find out that, yeah, they are actually sharing your data. And then I've got some final recommendations here. And of course, down at the bottom, we have a glossary for anybody who saw some terms or anything that I was discussing. I tried to put a list of stuff down there that if you didn't follow along, there's a breakdown of it. But we have to regularly test for vulnerabilities or exploits. We just, we have to. It's got to be done, okay? Uh, if you're not doing it, if you're not testing your defenses, you're doing yourself a disservice. If you have a WordPress site and you share that WordPress site with a few users, set yourself up with a day or an evening where you set up WP Crack and you enumerate your user list and you execute the top 500 passwords. And just make sure that nobody's broken. Because if they are, you can sit down and you can have a conversation with that person. Hey, I got into your account. Your account shows this password. That's a problem. We need to talk about security. We need to sit down and have a talk, OK? And guess what? In real companies, that happens. That's what penetration testers do. They go in and they make an attempt to get into a system. They try to break in. They try to find vulnerabilities. And then they tell you about those vulnerabilities. Hey, this is how I got in. This is where I found a problem. And then, of course, because I'm just begging for it, contribute to the community by creating reduced size Docker images for tools. If anybody wants to take me up on that, I would really appreciate it. Put a little effort into giving back to the community. It really does help. So. That is essentially our thing. And since it is the end here, I would like to open up for questions. Right, I have a question. OK, cool. Last time you talked about you had a Raspberry Pi and you used to the hotspot. I do. Can you make something like that with like a tablet instead of a Raspberry Pi? The only problem with that is you need to be able to have either two uh, wireless network cards or the wireless network card. So essentially, you need to be able to set up an access point, And then you also need to have a card that can be used to communicate out. So potentially, if you have a tablet that's maybe running, I guess, a rooted copy of Android or a way to be able to run two separate Wi-Fi networks, yes. But it's much easier with the um, Raspberry Pi, because they have like blueprints and plans online that literally take like 15 minutes. You plug in two items and you run a script and you're up and running. So, and it also breaks it down like the, um, the little Wi-Fi dongles. They actually say like for Raspberry Pi, they're very well supported, they have great drivers, all of that stuff's already pre-built. So the way that I'm doing it is just super, super easy, like very casual. Yes? How relevant is all this going to be when quantum computing comes around? You know what? I don't know. Because I guess if you want to get into like the conspiracy theory side, there are probably groups that are already running quantum computers and have access to some pretty heavy duty processing power and have already sort of semi broken stuff, maybe. But that goes into like, do we believe that or not? Is it true? I don't know. Um, <laughs> There's some people back there giving me the, the sure sign. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Because I don't have access to that stuff. And so. I think it's on the way. <laughs> I, I would assume that we're not far from it. There's enough discussion. What's that? They're working the stock market oh. right now. They'll get to us later. I would. I mean, I wouldn't. If you're filming that, I wouldn't. I would definitely not use quantum computers for the stock market. But yeah. I mean, there's the potential uses for that stuff is so, like, the imagination is the limit. I mean, you could be filthy rich, all sorts of stuff with it. So maybe, I guess that's the, the final answer on that. Yes? We use Google Doc uh -huh. to manage our documents right now. And are we still potentially subject to ransomware attack? OK, so let me just tell you right now, there was a 
very recent, like within the past couple of days, attack that was executed in which a person pretended to be Google. And the way that they did it was they named their application Google Inc. And then asked for permission for access to people's accounts. And then once they received permission to those accounts, they were able to pivot by getting the username and password, getting access to the emails, and then going in through a person's, like, all of their contacts and stuff, and then sending out ransomware that way. So, like, your Google Docs themselves, probably right now, not going to get ransomed. But somebody who gets access to people's accounts that are connected to that Google account, you can pivot off of that to execute an attack. And that has been done, like, recently within the past couple of days. So you, you do have vulnerabilities there, but I wouldn't say that like the idea that one day you'll just get up and all of those documents will be encrypted, probably not as likely. So I don't know if that helps you, but essentially it gets down to the whole world's on fire. We just got to decide what, what fire we're going to put out and which ones we just kind of have to deal with. Anything else? Yes. Yes. VPNs. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, and we've talked about VPNs here in some of our previous stuff, but I will go over. A VPN is going to only be as secure, of course, as the hardware itself. So if you have control over the, the hardware and you have physical access to that hardware and you know that that physical access is secure, you are most likely more secure than somebody who does not have physical access to their hardware. So if you're on shared hosting and you set up a VPN, that's super cool, but potentially the people at the shared hosting company have access to the system and can listen in on what you're doing. Okay, so case in point, the folks in Anonymous, they bought PIA, or not, I'm sorry, Hide My Ass. They chose Hide My Ass as their VPN, which is a British company. And essentially they decided that they were all gonna get together as a group and pay like $10, $15 a month for Hide My Ass because Hide My Ass says we don't keep logs, okay? And that's a VPN, it says we don't keep logs. And not only that, it was in capital letters. So you know they were serious, <laughs> okay? So it said in great big old capital letters, we don't keep logs. Well, the FBI, upset with Anonymous, for reasons, decided to go over to Britain and knocked on the door and said, yo, give us the logs. And hide my ass, said, oh, we don't, we don't keep logs, don't you see the capital letters? And they said, give us the logs or else and they said oh yeah here's the logs <laughs> oh, sorry just kidding yeah ju essentially just kidding yeah here is the logs so even though it says in giant capital letters we don't keep logs and even though it says like your data is safe and secure with us and even though it says all of these things at the end of the day you're at the mercy of whoever it is that you're working with and there's a lot of moving uh cogs in the machine so if you have access to the hardware you have access to the operating system. You are in total control of the pipe that is running out of that data center. Uh, you are in total control of the uh, operating system image that was used. Because potentially, if I own a data center and I want to infect your system, I'm not going to do something overt. I'm going to take the image and I'm going to infect like GCC. So the compiler that's going to compile all the code on your server, I'll infect that and then allow you to install that image on your server and then as you app get update and app get install and do everything my persistent threat is going to be to add code down at the bottom that essentially sends me everything so and i can do that inside of gcc or inside of your compiler or whatever tool set like your tool chain once i have access to your tool chain you're done you're cooked and you wouldn't know that i'm in there because who here has ever sat down and actually looked line by line through your tool chain yeah, me neither. So the whole world's on fire. I can't tell you that everything's going to be secure or not, but a, a VPN gives you a relative amount of security against anybody who's attempting to eavesdrop on your communication. And because a VPN includes encryption, that is a large bonus to you. But a state actor or somebody with a level of skill or somebody, excuse me, who has access to the hardware, it does nothing for you. So it goes back to what's your threat? What, what are you up against? Because that's, what, that's, what that's where it's going to put you. Anything else? 
should I put some pictures of like dogs or cats or something up here so we all feel better? Absolutely. <laughs> No? Yes. So you're saying that um, for SSH, yes. yeah. if you disable the being able to lock your password and you use an SSH key, uh -huh. is that reasonably <laughs> sufficient or not good enough? Depends on your threat. But an SSH key is going to be infinitely more secure as long as you protect those keys than a password. So if you are using a password, that's great. If you can use it with two-factor authentication, because you can add a Google Authenticator to the SSH, even better, add two-factor authentication. Because even if somebody were to steal your laptop and get access to the keys, so A, they have to get into the laptop. Hopefully, you've encrypted your laptop, and you're using a strong password on the laptop. So they have to get past that, and then they still have to get into the the system. And then at the end of the day, they still need access to your second factor of protection layers the more layers you can put and the more layers you're comfortable with if your skill level and your confidence level is high enough that you can add those layers all the better you're the only thing you're doing is benefiting yourself anything else no uh, so I guess that's it for this evening I want to tell you all thank you very much for coming I really appreciate it